<laughs> All right. Well, here we are uh, this afternoon, this evening uh, in uh, in Spanish time. I have uh, Carlos. Uh, in, is it Marquez? Would that be the correct pronunciation there? It's Marquez. 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 Okay. So my apologies there, Carlos. Uh, so so let's welcome him because he's got a uh, a fascinating new design that I wanted to have a conversation with you about, Carlos, uh, in a designer deep dive so that we can uh, learn more about you, learn more about the game and where it came from and its genesis. I think it's uh, it's going to be exciting and interesting, but uh, based on my rule reading anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm keen to see the eventual game when it comes out on Kickstarter later this year. So, Carlos, why don't you say hi to everybody, introduce yourself and, uh, and tell us a little bit about uh, your uh, about yourself, first of all. Okay, so hello everyone. My name, as you said, is Carlos Marquez. I am Spanish. I'm from Spain, from a city in the south of Spain called Granada, which is um, mm. an old historical city that I invite all of you and encourage to visit with the beautiful yes. Alhambra, which is this Moorish castle that we have here. Uh, I am. Uh, I have been a lecturer at the University of Granada for 25 years. I teach English uh, there. And um, I have two children, I have a wife, uh, no pets because I live in a flat and I think it's not very nice uh, to have dogs right. in, in right. flats. And uh, my, my hobby is uh, wargaming, board gaming and uh, more, more specifically uh, wargaming. I will play almost any uh, uh, board game which tells you a story. It has to tell me a story for me to like it. And that's why I like war games best because they tell me a story uh, and they, they tell me a story about history. So it brings together two of my passions, which is history and board gaming. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, now uh, your uh, and is this your going to be your first full game design, Carlos? Yes. Uh, yes. This is my first uh, 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 game that's going to be to be published. I have, if I may say so, I have another game in the GMT P500, which is called Imperial Fever, which is about oh. colonialism. Oh, and okay. that would be like my second uh, project uh, if it does reach that magic figure of 500 pledges, which is uh, on the way, on the way to do it. Well, good. Well, now we'll uh, we'll obviously have to have a talk about that again at, at some at some other point. But we'll focus to today on uh, your game that is called The Other Side of the Hill, and it's uh, somewhat unique in World War II titles in that it brings a lovely blend of uh, strategy and resource management, and uh, if we could call our generals workers, worker placement, and war gaming and the war and discussing and exploring World War II entirely from the German point of view and from the German perspective and how, how will these generals be successful for themselves, but then also for the Fuhrer uh, and for their ultimate goals or whatever the strategies that have, that have been and tasks have been set. So can you tell me a little bit about uh, and, and I've got some uh, screen images here that I might share. And if you have some, we can share some along the way as well. Uh, there's some buttons down the bottom that you can click on to uh, present if you wish to do so. Uh, but tell us about the genesis of the idea for yourself or what, what captured your excitement and imagination about showing the, the challenges of the German generals during World War II. Okay, well, I've been um, interested in World War II since I was 10 years old, and I started uh -huh. uh, reading about it. I've got lots of books about it. I have always been reading about it. So I've always been interested in that topic. And I also find when I read about history, I find uh, myself drawn to uh, people not just uh, you know the big machines of economics and the price of wheat and all that, mm -hmm. uh, but also to people and how people experience history and how people affect history. And I find that that is not frequently uh, dealt with in, 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 in war games. In war games, you uh, have your battalions, you have your divisions, you have your armies or army groups or corps or whatever, but you rarely have... Um, uh, generals or leaders beyond, you know, the ability to uh, influence battle or combat or whatever. But I do find that personal um, um, 
elements uh, such as personalities, jealousy, uh, rivalries, um, uh, ambitions. I think mm -hmm. that those also play an important role in the way history uh, moves forward. And also, I've always been very, very, very much interested in the topic of loyalty and how um, both in literature and also in, in, in board games and in history, and how, it, how easy it is to um, corrupt uh, loyalty and how easy it is to um, hide yourself behind loyalty. That is, And that is, I think, that the Second World War II and the German officer corps, I think, is a great example of that because you have people with conflicting loyalties there, loyalty to the people, loyalty to the, the, the loyalty they had sworn to the fear, and you had most people choosing the loyalty that probably was easiest for them, which is the yes. to the fear. And you have a very small number of really brave and courageous and admirable people who uh, took uh, loyalty to their own conscience uh, first. And those were the ones that were uh, dissidents uh, during, the, during the Third Reich. So yes. a, a game that uh, brings this element and sees or tries, tries to portray how these elements affect the development of the war is something that uh, I hadn't really uh, seen or played. And hey, if you know Tolkien and the Inklings, um, mm -hmm. uh, they said that they uh, they wrote the books that they would like to read. So uh, in a way, I have designed uh, the game that I would like to, to play. And that includes these elements about um, people, about how they affect history, and about uh, loyalty, conflicting loyalties, and also corrupted uh, loyalties. Yes, yes. Yes, interesting. And uh, when you when you went about this exercise for the the design, how how did you how did you drill in on the on the generals and which ones and what 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 was the what were the catalysts here for for that for it? Okay, um, uh, I've I've gone a long way. When I started uh, uh, designing this game, I was thinking about um, uh, a game about the plot against Hitler. That was the original mm -hmm, intent mm -hmm. of the game. But as I started, you know, to think about that, the more the game was drawn towards uh, war and towards how the war was being uh, waged, how it was being fought, uh, what the generals were doing there. So. Now the game includes, um, it depends on uh, how many stretch goals uh, will, be, uh, um, will be reached, but there are something between, something like between 40 and 60 or 72 generals. And mm. Oh, wow, these I didn't include, realize there were that many. Yeah, wow. Yes, yes. This includes all the generals that during the Second World War held the position of army commander or army group commander for longer than six months. Okay. Um, okay. Which is, as I tell you, it's fifty some fifty four, I think I would say, and there are there's some, there are some others that may come up as a sort of uh, expansion also during the campaign, uh, but yes, uh, it's every general uh, which in the war held the position of army commander or army mm. group commander. Mm. Now, now, uh, in terms of gameplay, uh, what am I being tasked? to do as a general and what and how am I competing with other generals and how am I what am I doing as I'm playing the game uh, representing myself as as the general obviously there's some career aspects and then there's keeping the the uh, Hitler happy to uh, to the extent that you wish to do that but talk to me about how what am I doing as the as the game player Okay, first I want to clarify that there are there's actually two games in one. Mm. Uh, because there are if you have the rule books, there are two different rule books. Yes. And you play both games with the same components. Okay. So you have one competitive uh, game and you have one cooperative slash cooperative, uh, solitaire right. game. Okay. Right. And they are, you know, the same components, many of the same mechanics, but they are entirely different games. If you play the solitaire slash um, um, competitive Co cooperative game. What you are trying to do there is to uh, to do as well as you can playing the German uh, side during the war. So you are mm -hmm. trying to last as long as Germany uh, 
uh, did historically. And there are certain of victory, there's a certain amount of victory points that you're going to uh, get by the end of the game. And depending on your success, you're going to either uh, win the game or lose the game because you're going to lose the war. That's part yes. of the design tenet. You're going yes. to lose the war, but you may still uh, win the game if you manage to do certain things. Right. And that's the cooperative solitaire game. And then you have the competitive game, which is uh, where you are, uh, where I think best uh, portrays these um, uh, effects of command decisions and commanders in the war. And what you have there is uh, from two to four players, and it plays best with four players, but you can do it with two or three players. You have two or four players and they don't really represent uh, any individual generals. Uh, you have mm -hmm. your generals and you have for, um, for four players, you have like eight generals and you have them and whatever they do for you, um, the positions that they held, the command positions that they held on the board, the battles where they uh, intervene and where they win, that's going to give you prestige points. Okay, so those generals will give you prestige points. And the game is won by the player with most prestige points by the end of the game. Right. But uh, these generals are only one of the sources uh, to get prestige points. You also get prestige points. Uh, there's a rotating uh, um, uh, role that you play in the high command for each of the players. So you can be either the head of the OKW or you can be the head of operations or you can be the head of personnel or the head of production. And these, uh, uh, these roles rotate uh, every year. They change or they can change yes. every year. Every yes. year they are redistributed. And depending on how well you do with that section of the high command, you're also going to get prestige points. So you get I, that's, it's one thing I noticed there, Carlos, where, where I was reading the example of play that uh, folks were cons considering uh, playing a certain either card or token. And then they were like, ah, but if I do that, it's going to help this guy. So I don't want to do that. But I do want to help this guy, this other guy, because if he's successful, then I'm more successful. And, and so I, 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 I immediately saw the tension and the excitement that would be in uh, making those choices and, and either I'm, assu I'm assuming there's probably some little bit of diplomacy going on there, uh, you know, yeah. in personal yeah, interaction the, <laughs> as well. Negotiation. But the whole point about this is not just for people to have fun, which is the point there. Yes, but yes. the fact is that this actually represents uh, how the German high command worked because we do worked, have yeah. this idea that it was a monolithic structure, well right. greased, that worked perfectly, that they um, they were a very uh, sort of perfect machine that um, where discipline was paramount and everybody knew their place. No, <laughs> not, right, at, all. Right. not right. at all. When you read about World War II and when you read about uh, the generals and not just their memoirs, <laughs> because in their memoirs, they tell you what they what they want you uh, yes, to know. Yes. Every, everything was perfect uh, according exactly. to them. Exactly, everything yes. is Hitler's <laughs> fault. According yes. to them, it's all it's all Hitler's fault. Uh, right. They they if they had listened to them, if they had if if only they had listened to them, the war uh, could have been won. Okay, so but this uh, this tension that this this negotiation, this tension, this looking over the shoulder to see what the other people are doing, this represents the tension, the overlapping um, uh, responsibilities that 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 Hitler had uh, among his gang because he wanted to keep them under his control. So what mm -hmm. he did was he gave them overlapping areas of decision so that he would remain the referee and uh, be still the ultimate uh, referee uh, to, yes. uh, to yes. decide on who was right or wrong. And this is typical of dictators. Uh, Franco in Spain had a similar system. Uh, he stayed above politics and he had people squabbling under him because everyone knew that he was the one that would make the final decision. The final decision. And this is what Hitler did too. So in the game, that uh, tension that you describe uh, is the source of fun in the game, but it also represents, recreates uh, this less than perfect working of the German right. uh, war machine. Yes, yes. And I, I think we, you know, there's some, some games have uh, represented that more in a, sort of uh, mechanical way 
the production spirals or whatever it may be where there's limitations upon how many U-boats can be made versus how many aircraft that can be made. And you've, there's always trade-offs and things like that. But this, this uh, really is imposing the decisions upon the players to drive the, the decision-making of what's going to happen for the next cycle or season in the game uh, and, and where the resources are going to be allocated. So I, I really like that aspect of, of the game. So, so uh, tell me more, of, tell us about, so we talked about the, the generals and, and, you know, conceptually they're, they're our workers, right? So what, how are we, what are we using and what are we doing during a game turn, for instance, to facilitate activity and uh, engage in the in the game and, and see what's happening on the Eastern Front versus Africa versus the Med uh, or the Western Front. So t tell us, perhaps just share a little bit more around that. And then I'd, then I'd like to ask you a few questions about the rule book. Okay, I'm going to try and show my screen oh, if, I can, so let, let me, if uh, I can make that happen. So I choose present, share screen, Yep. Uh, share screen. Mm -hmm. It should ask you for some approval somewhere along the way. Okay, there is this go. working? There you go. Is this working? Yep, you got it. Okay, great. And we can so, do this now with full screen. That's all we can see now. So you can use your pointer or mouse to. Okay, this is the board, uh, uh, the, the, the game board, and there are lots of things here. Uh, but I wanted to show you this because each turn <clears throat> is a season uh, in the war. Okay, so you have uh, each year of the war here and you have the four seasons. Okay, and each turn is divided into an administrative phase and an operations phase. Okay. And in the summer, you have one administrative phase and two operation phases because the good weather allows much more movement and actions and so on. Okay, So during the administrative phase, what you do is uh, you manage the economy, you get your replacements, uh, you adjust uh, what you're going to be producing during this, uh, during this turn, and then you play uh, production directives, which um, improve the economy or develop technological projects such as uh, the V weapons or the Tiger tanks or um, the heavy bombers or, you know, projects that actually never happened, like the nuclear bomb, it's also there. So you can right. play production directives, you can play political directives, and these include diplomacy, but also things uh, that help um, maintain or increase the fanaticism of the, of, of the German army. And then you play your military directives, which is, th that will give you the opportunity or will give you the opportunity to attack uh, during that. Okay, so that's the administrative phase, and that's what you do, do there. And then you move to the operations phase, and there you do a strategic warfare, which is um, the f bombing of Germany, the Battle of the Atlantic, and that's uh, mm. summarized in in a in a die roll. Then you move your armies around uh, the board. Okay, uh, you adjust command, so you pick uh, generals if there are any vacancies. Uh, you uh, try you, you determine whether question generals are dismissed or whether they stay in command. And then you move to the axis offensive. So you do your attacks and you try to expand uh, the, um, the, you know, the, the areas controlled by Germany. And then you move to the Western offensive, which may include landings. So they are going to attack you uh, in some places of the map. And this is determined by cards. And then you move to a Soviet offensive, the, the USSR is uh, at war. And then you, you have some um, um, uh, um, organizational uh, final uh, element segment where you look at your objectives yeah. and so on, yeah. supply check and all that. So yeah. what you have here is um, more or less what a whole turn uh, looks like. Okay? And how t talk to me about the map and about the structure of the map and the boxes and how you because it looks quite involved, but it's it's it looks interesting, right? So talk to me about how you uh, how you came up with the design versus say uh, something more abstract, for instance. Okay, so, so this um, this map looks actually busier than it is when you are playing. Uh, if you look at it, you have like uh, each of these squares is an area, okay, which may be mm -hmm. a country or two countries or part of a country like in the USSR or in France. And mm -hmm. if you look at them, you have like, this is the Eastern Front and they have like a, this reddish background. This is the Southern Front with a yellowish background. Yes. And this is the Western Front with a bluish background, okay. And Germany is in the middle, okay. So the way this works is a little bit 
um, uh, similar to uh, states of siege. I don't know if you know those games. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. so what you have is you have wooden discs here in these sectors. So what you're going to try to do is to push your uh, black axis discs as far away from Germany as you can in each of these directions uh, from Germany. And when the Allies attack, they're going to try to push them back into mm -hmm. Germany. Okay, And you have these uh, sectors here the ones with the cross, these are called Festung sectors, okay? And these eight sectors are actually part of Germany. So each one, each time one of these sectors is lost, they come here to the collapse of Germany. Once you have three, three uh, discs here, uh, you have to start rolling for the collapse of Germany. And if you roll equal to or under the number of discs that you have there, the game ends immediately with the collapse of Germany. Mm. Interesting, uh, interesting. Okay, and um, that's something interesting too, and it's that even if Germany collapses, there's a winner of the game, because as I told you, there are uh, you can get points uh, as you know for the things that your generals do. You can get points for the things that you do as the head of your uh, section of the high command. And at some point in 1942, if you play scenarios that uh, start there or include uh, 1942 and and, and later you're going to get an agenda card. And some of those agendas are going to be secret. So you're going to have the uh, objectives of a certain faction, like the old guard, or like the sympathizers, or like mm. the professionals, or the dissidents, okay? Mm. So and you're going to have points by the end of the game, depending on how much uh, or how, um, uh, yes, how much, how true you are to the goals of each of those factions, okay? So gotcha. the OKW is going to get points for resisting as far as they can, that is for resisting up to sept, uh, spring 1945, and the dissidents are going to get a lot of points if Germany collapses before that, okay? So no matter what happens, a player is going to win. Germany is going to lose the war at some point. The game stops always spring 1945, but Usually, when that happens, Germany is, is has either collapsed before that, or is soon going to collapse. The way the way the game the way the, way the game plays. Okay, but one player is going to to be winning uh, always. Always, yes, excellent, excellent. Uh, it looks uh, looks fascinating. Now, uh, so from a uh, from rulebook perspective, your your layout here is real. Chris seems very crisp and concise, uh, and I've. As I read through, I think we're at about 30 odd pages on the uh, multiplayer uh, version of the rules that I was I was spending some time on. Uh, nice examples for combat and for uh, uh, some of the cycles that you have to go through here. So how when you're writing your rules, how were you, how were you, were you just trying to envision this post uh, post prototype play and trying to structure the rules around it, or did you really have a view in mind of how things were going to come together by borrowing from other other rules, concepts, and other games? Okay, um, all right. Um, I've been working on this design for ten years now. So just ten uh, years. Yes, yes, for a long yes. time. This is yes. um, this is a favorite <laughs> pet <laughs> project of mine. I've been working on it for a long time. So this has. Um, uh, this has been a long process. Now, when about how I came about uh, writing the rules, um, I inspired this, or I was inspired uh, when it comes to the rules structure by Axis Empires, Total Air Creek. I don't know if you know that by Decision Games, uh, where they have at the beginning uh, sort of housekeeping rules, and those are the rules that tell you what the components are, uh, how the map works. Uh, how the control of the areas. I mean, general instructions about concepts which are important for the for the game, and then um, uh, the, the the instructions follow the sequence of play. And that is what I did there. What I did was have a housekeeping uh, section while I give information about the generals, how they work, the areas, right. what they are, uh, how players communicate with one another, and then I just started explaining the game. Uh, phase by phase and segment by segment. And then I had another section for combat, specific section uh, about how combat is uh, is uh, fought and how it is resolved. Mm -hmm. And then I had 
one for events and then some minor things such as uh, Germany, sorry, France and Italy and uh, the OKW overruling other players. So some miscellaneous rules at the end. Yeah, so so I think uh, it, that's an interesting approach too. So I appreciate you sharing that. And I, I apologize for stepping away from the, the screen for a second, but I had a, had a chicken attacking the front door. So uh, <laughs> what are you going to do? Um, so where were we? Right, so rules. Now, uh, when you t tell me a little bit more about your playtesting and the folks that uh, were involved. So how did you go through that exercise? And, and you said it took 10 years. So when did you really start playtesting with just beyond yourself? Okay. Um, first, I must say this is not my first game. I have been designing games for a long time, but okay. I never actually intended to publish them. I, as I told you, it's like Tolkien <laughs> and his <laughs> stories about, you know, the first age that he wrote. I mean, I mean, humbly compare myself with Tolkien. But what I mean is that it's something that I did for my own enjoyment and for that of my friends who indulged me uh, yes. playing yes. Uh, the yes. things that I, that I designed or the games that I designed. Uh, so what I did was I took this game to Spanish convention that... Uh, takes place in Balagoz every, every year. And I, I happened to coincide there with uh, Volko Runke, uh, ah, the designer okay. of the coin system. And man, that was a game changer, if I can say that. Uh, he was very nice. He was extremely helpful. And he was the one who encouraged me uh, to get the game published because I had never actually intended uh, to publish it. I just have it, had it to play with my friends here in my local club. So he actually intended me, uh, uh, sorry, uh, encouraged me uh, yes. to 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 uh, publish the game. And that's why I started writing to uh, publishing companies also with his guidance. Uh, he yes. also um, took the prototype and he played with his friends. Uh, he, he had some blind uh, playtesting, so he played without my teaching. So uh -huh. there's been playtesting going on both because I also have a vassal module uh, with the prototype mm -hmm. art, which is very different from this. So I have been organizing games with that too. Uh, also lots of, um, of um, uh, real games, you know, on, on, yes. on, a, on a table too. Yes. And also blind uh, uh, playtesting with people that I send the game to so that they would play without me telling them, uh, will help me telling them how to play. So if, to make sure that they could learn to play right. from the rules. Which I think is a huge part of playtesting, in the, at least in the United States, that I don't see happening as well as perhaps in some of the European design shops. And I don't know why that is. I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know whether it's because of the volume of games that have come out in the US or not, but I, I often see some games are stuck some game designers are stuck with the same two or three buddies or maybe it's five or ten buddies that all that play test their games so they know how the designer thinks or or they're 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 in such close concert with the designer that they understand what's supposed to be happening and lots of things end up being missed in the rules so I, I'm, it's encouraging to hear you doing blind testing uh, at such a scale at such a level so that's that's wonderful I thought it was very important. And there is another kind of testing that I think is very important. Yes, and that's play testing with the final components. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I, I find that uh, some of the mistakes that I have spotted in actually this, uh, this uh, because this is not the final version, this is um, the one that we are working on right now. We actually have copies of the book, of the game, sorry. We are playing on them. And by playing on the actual copies, we are seeing errata that we had yes. missed right. looking at the screen hundreds of times. You don't yes. see them until you have them on the board. And you also make sure that um, from the point of view of playability, the game actually can be played with the uh, elements that you have there. Because sometimes you find that uh, in games, uh, they all work nicely in the mind of the designer mm -hmm. and they work well <laughs> on Vassal because Vassal yeah. is very forgiving yes. because you can stack lots of counters there and they will give you information. It's going to do lots of routines for you. But they don't actually, uh, or, or I find that some uh, games do not seem to be actually uh, tested with the actual components on an actual table. Right. And then you get right. errata. 
uh, you know, yes. just with the, the last yes. game I got, I got it uh, this morning. There was a little piece of paper with an, a rattle. And, you know, I know there are going to be a rattle in, in this game because a game with three rule books, 30 something pages each one with 300 cards and lots of counters, there are, there are bound to be a rata there. Yes. Uh, but I know how many I have caught, how many a rata I have caught, and I would have missed them if uh, if I hadn't played with the actual uh, components uh, right. of the published game. Right, right. It makes perfect sense. And so, uh, so from your perspective, you know, NAC picked up the, the uh, design from you and they're going to publish it and uh, go to a Kickstarter uh, potentially later in, um, in uh, excuse me, in, I'm just looking at the screen, trying to bring that up and make that larger for you. Can we do that? Nope, that's as big as it's going to get. Where Here we go. Uh, are they, so you're, you're planning on bringing uh, potentially the publisher, NAC or NAC Games, is bringing the game to Kickstarter in, uh, late November, potentially, yeah, yeah, uh, possibly early December, but some sometime around there. Just uh, just as all the uh, as everyone gets all their uh, their money uh, before Christmas to to go buy gifts, so good timing. Uh, the how are they how are they planning? Or do you know? Do you have a feel for how many copies that they'll produce? Uh, how excited are they about the title? Tell tell us a little bit about the publisher and. And, uh, and the public, it's a Spanish them. publisher, uh, Nat War Games, and they are, uh, well, it's um, <laughs> maybe not the one that should say that, but I think they are very excited about right, the game right, right, because right. they feel it's going to be like their introduction to the American market. So that's nice. why yeah. they, are, they have already published some games in, in English and Spanish, and they yes. do have a web page uh, for the United States. But yep. this uh, Kickstarter project with two different games, one fully in English, one fully in Spanish, uh, which is going to get advertised in Board Game Geek, which is going to uh, have uh, to appear in wonderful uh, YouTube channels like like yours and, and others. For them, it's like their attempt of, um, uh, you know, breaking into the, the, the U.S. market. The US so they are very... They are very uh, uh, excited about that. And I think that the Kickstarter campaign is built around that. So right. uh, from the way I understand, um, I think the appeal of the Kickstarter campaign is not going to be about fancy uh, stretch goals, miniatures, and mm -hmm. that sort of mm -hmm. thing. There are going to be some things there, some improvements to the materials, uh, extra cards and all that. But I think that they are working very hard on making it have an attractive price. Right, ah, the price okay. that yeah. for the for the uh, number and the quality of the components of the game uh, will be an attractive one, especially as compared to the retail price. So there's going to be a significant right. uh, reduction to the price of, to the price of the game uh, for the Kickstarter campaign, and this is something that I was very insistent upon because I find that. Um, very frequently, people who uh, participate on Kickstarter, they don't feel that they are rewarded enough for their effort and for their investment in games. And they find that they pay, at the end of the day, they are paying for the game uh, a similar amount to the money that they would be paying if they waited uh, to go to their brick and mortar shop and bought it there or bought it online. So uh, this yes. effort that Nightcore Games is making on keeping uh, uh, the price as low as possible. It's also, like that. again, possible because they are trying to use this as the way of entering the U.S. market. So they are taking lots of risk there, financial risk, and also, um, uh, you know, that's why they are reducing uh, the price uh, so much. If you look at the quality right. of the game, right. I can't tell you about the the price. Um, I would have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. No, of course. No, we, we need to. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll wait for that excitement. Yeah, yeah. But I can tell you, it's going to be definitely uh, much lower than a hundred dollars. Ah, wonderful. And and I also noticed on their website that uh, 
they, they, you know, the couple of war games that they have, the components are very, as you, as, uh, as now has become expected of European games, very high quality. So uh, I'm, I'm excited for you, for you to be working with them. I think that's awesome. Uh, so tell me, so tell me about this card. We've got my, my little buddy Wunstead uh, up here. Tell us, uh, tell us about this card. What you're wanting to share there? For us. Okay, what you have here, I was showing this because these are examples of uh, of the general cards in the right. game. Okay, so you have uh, these are generals from 1939. Okay, and there are generals mm -hmm. all the way down to you can see lots of generals okay yeah, up yeah. to 1943 uh, they're going to be entering the game okay lots of generals entering the game okay and um, they all have the same thing you have the year of entry this is the faction they belong to this is the old guard these are the old prussian generals mm -hmm. so you're going to get lots of them at the beginning of the war okay here these are the sympathizers these are the more um sort of uh people who were much more politically uh, uh, committed, uh, committed to the, and motivated to the, Nazi, right, right. to the Nazi regime, and many of them were responsible for war crimes. Okay, so these are uh, identified by this uh, rule. You have these ones, which are the professionals, and these are the ones that were trying to, um, you know, stay out of politics, which in a way is a way of actually taking a political stance in this case, uh, in favor of the regime. Uh, mm -hmm. But these people were more about um, uh, the army and saving soldiers than they were about um, um, about um, you know uh, uh, the uh, success of, of of the Nazi regime. And then you have a few generals um, like uh, von Witzleben, and these are dissidents. Actually, von Witzleben uh, was hanged uh, by mm -hmm. the Germans. By the Nazi, uh, the infamous uh, uh, Judge Fisler, because he was a participant in the uh, July 20th uh, plot to yes. assassinate Hitler. Yeah. So these uh, generals who were against Hitler belong to this uh, faction. Okay, so you have those four factions. So generals belong to those factions, and players are going to get uh, some of those factions as their agenda cards. So they are going to be identified with those. And then you have the seniority, which is this number here. So the higher the seniority, uh, the easier it is to uh, place them in uh, command posts. Uh, the in higher command seniority post, right. is Gerd von Rundstedt. Okay? <clears throat> and this one is the confidence. It is once um, they fail, and they will fail, um, they become questioned either because they have to retreat or because they fail to uh, deliver uh, victories right. in right. their offensives. So they have to roll a die. And if they roll uh, uh, over that number, higher than that number, three or higher, the general is dismissed. Okay, so he disappears from the game. If they roll that exact number, the general becomes a dissident. And this is something that happened with uh, some generals. Mm -hmm. And if they roll the, be, below that, then they stay. So Rundstedt uh, was actually dismissed three times. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> that's his right. confidence that's is right. so low. And that is why he's got this special rule. He's the only general that when dismissed can return the following uh, year because right. he did that, okay? But however, if you go and look at uh, Reichenau, which was a very, um, he was identified with the Nazi regime. Uh, his confidence is much higher. So uh, in a die roll of six, he's only going to get uh, become a dissident if he rolls a six. And then if he's questioned again and he rolls a six again, then he's going to be dismissed, okay? So he's much harder to dismiss, okay? However, there is this likelihood that uh, from 1941 on, he may yes. suffer from a heart attack, which is what actually happened to him. Right, 1941, right. he died of a, of a heart attack. And this may also happen in the game, okay? So that's the seniority and the confidence. And you also, each general also have also has a box here, which is Special how abilities. They affect, yeah. And this yeah. is the important part, which is how they affect uh, combat. Okay. Right. So this tells you because you can always have a general uh, participate in combat, even if their ability is not triggered. You have him there because you want the prestige to uh, mm. if you win the battle. Okay. But generals will affect certain battles. So for instance, Reichenau. Uh, can affect battles against the allies, the Western allies, and the Soviet Union, okay? Um, 
for instance, von Kluge only of uh, his abilities only triggered against the Soviet Union. Soviet Union, yes, I saw okay. that. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, interesting. Exactly, and then you have here. This implies whether uh, his abilities triggered in attack, and then you have this stuka if it is in attack or in defense, and you have this shield which is in defense. Okay, um, um, and also the color of this symbol tells you the terrain. Okay, so if it is green, it if you look at the map. You have the sectors have different colors. Okay, mm. so mm -hmm. green. Mm -hmm. The battle has to be in a green sector for von Rundstedt's ability to actually gotcha. be triggered. Gotcha. Okay? Can, can you? Uh, can, oh, yes. go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. What I was to say is that if the background of of the symbol is white, it's any terrain. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Can you go back to the map and perhaps just zoom in on uh, one one say mi middle. Uh, section near Poland or Russia, just so we can just sort of see a little more detail. Just to, Okay, to I will more. try to zoom in, but uh, my yeah, and if it's and if, it, if it gets warped, that's okay. old and tired. And it, that's okay, that's okay. <laughs> okay, it might freeze. So I'm going to try to do that. That's what I meant, okay? So if we give it some time, I'll I'll bring it closer. Um, but it's, it, it's re repainting itself. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it takes, because it's also a very big file. This is the PDF. Uh, file. Oh, it's PDF yeah. of the map, yeah. So I probably it's, asked. It's, it's very, oh. very big. Okay, so um, I might have an image of that too. Of that's it. Okay, so I will try go. to get closer again. There we go. That's that's great. That's great. That helps. That's okay. Helpful. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's refreshing again. Not a problem. Yeah. Um, well, I tell you what. Uh, while it's doing that, were there other uh, aspects of the of the game that you're excited about that we haven't really that I haven't touched on or asked you questions about yet that you would like to discuss? Uh, I was uh, thinking I could show you some examples of uh, military directives. Okay. Sure. Sure. This is, but, for instance, the Poland. card that is yeah. the invasion of Poland, and you're right. going to have historical military directives like this, but mm -hmm. you're also going to have things that never happened. Like the invasion of Great Britain, right? See okay? that, yeah. uh, or even um, uh, the invasion of Turkey or the invasion of Spain. Okay, mm -hmm. and the same thing happens with political uh, events. You have the diplomacy with Hungary, and these are historical. But you can try to bring Greece on the Axis side, or Vichy, or Spain on the Axis side, or Turkey. On the axis side so you can go the historical road or you can go an alternative road okay and the same thing with production cards okay this is a production card and this is the responsibility of industry which will give you resources but will mm. reduce fanaticism because it reduces state control of the industry and you can also have projects like for instance nuclear power okay mm. so you you can try to develop it's difficult because you need to roll a five at least five or six in order to advance it and it requires five successes in order to get that you have others uh strategic bombers never actually developed it's uh also four four or more but it's only three successes that you do need okay mm. and these ones are historical the, the assault guns so you have uh you know historical paths but you also have alternative um 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 actions or paths that you can try uh to go gotcha. to see what would have happened if uh germany had taken a different road and uh spoiler you're going to lose the war anyway but um but i think it's fun to explore other avenues and to see um, how things would have worked uh, differently. Recently, I had a playtesting. I had one of those playtesting sessions where the players went for for Turkey. Um, they tried to activate uh, Greece as an Axis satellite, and they succeeded, which is actually quite difficult because I think you need something like a six. I yeah, you lucky. Need, yeah, yeah, yeah. You need yeah. a six because. Uh, Romania was already uh, an Axis satellite, so it was more difficult. So they rolled a six, and that opened up uh, the possibility of attacking Turkey. So they invaded Turkey in 1940, which in turn opened the Middle East. Um, if you go mm. back to the map, okay, uh, they that opened uh, the whole. Once you come to Turkey, it opens the Middle East, and you have resources. You have the 
the oil here. Okay. Right. So, right. Uh, and a, and again, a, back, a back door into Russia as well, potentially. It's, yeah. Yes. But the thing is that no matter what you do, the number of armies that you have is already set. So that implies that your front in Russia is going to be four areas wide. Okay. So attacking Turkey is going to make it five areas wide. Mm. And you have the same army. So you're going, it gives you opportunities, but it also implies risks. Yes. Okay. So, and that's what I was trying to, to, to look at. Okay. And I think that you can see it a bit better here. It's uh, kind of, uh, kind of gives me a feel. And I know that you'll probably, you, you, you may, you, you may get angry at this, but, uh, uh, uh feel for, uh, of almost like twilight struggle, but more, more kinetic, more a uh, more war gamey, right? Uh, in a in in the sense that you're 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 trying to manage these different areas and 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 open up uh, alternative uh, I, paths for to success. I don't see how I could get angry uh, if you compare me with Twilight Struggle. Good, okay, good. good, good <laughs> if you compare right. my game, with, it's a very big compliment uh, because I think it's a very successful game. I think it's sure. a very fun game. Uh, to play, and I think it's a good simulation of the Cold War. So, right, and right. and I, I I see what you mean. Uh, what I've been trying to do here is this is a game about simulating war. It's a game that is uh, about um, understanding how command uh, affects war, but the mechanics that I have been or that I have included in this game are not the traditional hex encounter yes, mechanics yes, that you yes. would get in a war game. They are uh, drawn or they are inspired in more uh, strategy or Euro-like games. Yes. Uh, um, for instance, uh, you have um, your, your resources and you have to manage the resources that you have and you can invest them in different things, but you have to decide where to invest those resources. And then you have armies, which are like workers and generals, which are like workers. So you send your your your, your armies and your generals to do uh, to do a job for you. So in a way, and in a way, yes, and you have these military directives, which are a little bit like contracts right, right. that you have in certain right. games. So the mechanics, yes, the mechanics are, uh, in a way, those of Euro games. But I think that, or I understand, or I would like to think that this makes the game uh, more innovative, more interesting. Um, and I hope this will make it more attractive um, uh, to players and also to different kinds of players. Mm -hmm. No, I think you've, uh, as, as we... As I said before, we we jumped on the recording. I think you've done a really nice job here of blending what what I would call traditional war gaming to traditional Euro Euro style gaming, and bringing the two things together in a in a way that leans more heavily into history and more heavily into the theme around World War Two, but then also it still gives you. A rich set of decision making, some nice storytelling, and then you've still got that. You've still got a kinetic element where you're going to have combat. You have to. Uh, you've got to have the right uh, Stuka capability at the, in the right area, and you've got to have the armies available and the right leadership to make things happen, so that your generalship is successful as you proceed up the prestige path. So it's it's a, a fascinating effort, and certainly. To me, to me anyway, uh, a unique approach. So I really like it. Thank you very much. I hope that once you get uh, the game, you're going to enjoy to enjoy playing it. If I can give some advice to those who approach the game for the first time, sure. uh, once they do get the game, um, I would uh, try to play it uh, solitaire first. Mm, I would try okay. to start uh, with the game solitaire because the mechanics are more or less the same. The objectives are different. There are limitations to the things that you can do. But you get the flow of the game because the game right. is not too complex. It's not too difficult, but it's very involved. There are lots of things that you have to do, and it's very procedural. So uh, it's the same procedures that you have to do every turn. And once you have uh, you know, played two or three turns, 
you will have internalized them. Okay. Right, right, right. right but right. it's going to be difficult and it's going, it can be, I think it can be frustrating for four people to do that internalizing process together. All no. together, yes. Exactly, yes. yes, because they are going to be looking up the rules, they're going to be looking at things, they're going, but once someone has played, you know, the shortest scenario, which is, you know, 1939, 1940, which is a short scenario at the beginning, once you get that under your belt, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get how the game works and what yeah. it is trying to do and yeah. how, and how it works. So my advice would be play it solitaire first. It's, it's got, you know, um, uh, dedicated solitaire rules, so you 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 can follow those rules. But the procedures are ninety percent of the same that you are going to use in competitive play later. So like, if one like person that. plays that, and then that person can be the guide. Uh, you can teach, for the teach your other your other opponents. exactly yeah, because uh, there is this um, uh, there is this uh, here this um, sequence of events, and there's a, a counter that's going to be moving there. So. If somebody just keeps moving uh, the counter and then summarizes what the other people, you know, what they are supposed to be doing in each of those places, it's going to make it much easier. Also, gotcha. there is a play aid. Uh, there's a player aid, which is um, an A3 uh, sheet folded. Okay, and you have a summary of the turn there. And once you start playing, you can play just with the play aid. You don't need uh, uh, to go to the rule unless right. you want to look at, you know specific things about what happens when uh, Vichy is created or what happens when Italy uh, collapses. And then you have to go to the rule book for that particular procedure. But gotcha. with regular procedures, you know, having played the game on your own, following the player aid, uh, that's uh, going to, uh, I think that's going to ease players into the game uh, much better. Otherwise, it's, I think it's going to feel frustrated. Um, and this is also something that I got from other people, uh, other YouTube channels that they are, uh, you know, play testing the game and they are making gotcha. videos of that. And that's what they said, that they were surprised that they thought the game was going to be difficult. But once they learned how to play, they taught other people how to play and they eased into the game uh, gotcha. even Young people, people 16, 18 years old. Oh, ah, wonderful. Play. That's yeah. great. They, yeah. Because because if you have somebody who knows how to game, after two or three turns, everybody knows uh, when they want to use their general, when they want to nominate their general, right. where they right. want to, to get their, their, their um, uh, which posts are the nicest for their generals, how you get prestige and where you get prestige from and what you want to compete about and when you want to push the OKW uh, and when you want to stop pushing in case they overrule you. So these um, mechanics um, get get easier after you play two or three turns. Excellent. Well, Carlos, I wish you all the best with this and I hope that uh, NAC uh, releases this for, uh, I guess, the American and Canadian Thanksgiving, which I think is coming up pretty pretty quickly so that you can, the Kickstarter will be live and we can all uh, celebrate some success for you for your first published game. Yeah. Thank you. And we are aiming at uh, delivering it on around September, <laughs> coinciding oh. with the beginning of the war. That's- Oh, uh, perfect. Yeah. That's our, our goal. But you know, you know how things work with, you know, with when yes. you are producing in China and you have, you know, this global, uh, surprises that this century is bringing <laughs> us. So that's what we are aiming at, but we are aiming for, but, um, but you know, we shall have to wait. Thank you very much. Oh, no, it's my pleasure. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you about your, your other title at some point in the near future. All right. Okay. That would be great. And um, I'm available uh, for that or for any other chat. This was very nice uh, yeah, it was being a, here. It was with lovely you. to meet you too. All right. All the very best.